Right, uh, tēnā koutou koutou everybody. Um, welcome to the day three of this fourth annual meeting um, of the Mapping Committee for South and West Pacific uh, Centre for the CB2030 project. It's great to see so many people here today. Um, we've had a couple of uh, amazing talks over the last uh, two days um, and some very interesting discussions and very interesting um, uh, areas of seabed mapping that are being uh, talked about. So I'm very excited and I thank you all very much for your attendance and listening. Before we start today, um, I'd like to just do some uh, basic housekeeping, um, just some reminders that it, if you're not presenting to keep your all cameras off and your microphones muted. Uh, and if you want to uh, raise a question or, or make a statement, use the raised hand function um, on Teams. This meeting is currently being recorded right now. Uh, and I think we'll start uh, with um, a review of the polls that we hosted yesterday. Um, so we asked two polls yesterday. The first was, do you plan to download the 2022 grid? Um, and this is with an understanding that the 2022 grid's just been released. This is the latest version of the GEBCO grid. 73% uh, said yes, 9% uh, said no, and 16% that said maybe. Um, one of the critical things to understand about the GEBCO grid is it's, it's, it's updated every year, usually around uh, World Hydro Day is the date we'll, we'll make the new release. Uh, and, and there are significant changes from year to year to year. So I know that there are a lot of GEBCO users out there um, and they use the GEBCO map for things like um, base services and WMS services for web apps. Um, it does pay to always download the latest version of it because you will pick up um, the new additions of new mapping data and, and corrections uh, to any errors that have been found in previous versions. The second poll uh, was about what organisation you work for. And this surprised me actually, 61% said uh, for government. Um, and the next highest is research institutes. I think that's really great to see uh, actually that there's such high governmental interest in um, CBD mapping around the Pacific. Uh, my assumption would have been uh, uh, more academically focused or more research institute focused, uh, but it's really pleasing to see government so well represented. So I think uh, we will crack on um, straight away to um, the first session this morning. Um, the first session will be moderated by uh, Mr. Glenn Rowe from Land Information New Zealand, um, which is the New Zealand's National Mapping Authority. So Glenn, over to you. Thank you very much. OK, thanks very much, Kevin. Can you hear me? Yep, we, and we can see you. Oh, that's good. OK, thank you. Yes, uh, kia ora katou. As Kevin said, my name is Glenn Rowe. I'm, I work for the New Zealand Hydrographic Authority and I'm a um, member of the Technical Management Committee for SALPAC. And it's my pleasure to moderate this session this afternoon. So we've got uh, five presentations to go through. Uh, and the first one, uh, I'd like to invite Christy Reiser, who's a bathymetry data manager at NOAA, to give us a presentation about IHO crowdsourced bathymetry. So over to you, Christy. Excellent, thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent, let me share my screen really quickly. Sorry, it's a little slow. It's, catch, it's catching okay. up. It's okay. While well, while Christy's loading her screen, just a, a reminder to people if they wish to answer, ask any questions, to uh, either put it in the chat or put their hand up, and there'll hopefully time for questions at the end of the presentation. So, over to you, Christy. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Okay. Yes, we can. I can see them now. Excellent. OK, um, yes, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. Um, as said, I'm the bathymetry data manager at the IHO Data Center for Digital Bathymetry. Uh, today, I'm also joined by my colleague and fellow data manager, Georgie Zelenek, who's going to be assisting me with adding some links into the chat and um, help with questions. And actually, I know the, the agenda says I'm going to talk about crowdsource bathymetry first and the DCDB second, but I'm going to flip those if you guys don't mind, just because my presentation is in that order. 
So during my presentation, I'd like to provide an update and overview of the IHO's DCDB, uh, data holdings and recent contributions and upcoming enhancements, and answer any questions you may have. Then I will switch gears and uh, discuss the data center's involvement and progress in the IHO crowdsource bathymetry project, the geographic filter, how to contribute data, current data uh, contributors, along with the CBED 2030 CSB project and the CSB working group. And we'll finish off with some Q&A time uh, for the CSB initiative. So to kick things off, I'll do a quick review of the IHO uh, Data Center for Digital Bathymetry, henceforth known as the DCDB. And I'll provide you with an update on what we've accomplished since we last spoke last year. Since I went into more detail in the previous years, I'll just give a brief overview today. The IHO DCDB is the recognized IHO repository for all ocean bathymetry data. The NOAA, the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has hosted the DCDB since 1990. Data that are sent to the IHO DCDB are also archived and shared freely and without restrictions to the public. Data archived at the DCDB are routinely used for the production of improved and more comprehensive bathymetric maps and grids in support of both regional and global mapping projects, such as the annual update to the JEBCO grids. Here you can see the newly published JEBCO grid as of last week, which estimates 23.4% of the seafloor has now been mapped. And uh, I included the previous year, the 20.6% um, uh, for comparison. Now we can compare that number to the DCDB data holdings um, where the estimated global seafloor coverage held uh, in the DCDB multi-beam archive is calculated to be about 12%. Uh, this 12% equates to roughly 65 terabytes of uncompressed or 30 terabytes of compressed bathymetric data. This includes over 3,500 multi-beam bathymetry surveys which are shown here in green track lines. Here you can see a list of some of our key data providers in the area since 2021, and the track lines of these data sets also shown in, the, uh, in green on the map. CSB data contributions shown here in pink continue to increase and flow into the DCDB on a daily basis. Now moving on to enhancements made over the last year, I'll first start with our map viewer. The viewer not only shows the global coverage of the DCDB's bathymetry data holdings, but also the spatial extent of data archived at other repositories via their web services. We're excited to see the number of contributed web services continue to grow. We were quite excited to work with LINS last year and have their services added. Um, users can now identify both freely available digital bathymetric survey um, surface models and also bathy data held um, and used by LINS on its New Zealand coastal nautical charts. Ship tracks for multi-beam bathymetric surveys from eFirmer services uh, were also added. Even though many of these surveys were also discoverable in the eModNet layers, this allows for easy attribution to eFirmer for their uh, contributions to open data. And while we've been displaying Aussie Bed's marine data portal services for a few years now, a variety of new services have been added recently, while others have been updated. Our own multi-beam bathymetry mosaic image service, which is a reflection of all multi-beam data in our archive, continues to be updated and allows the user to visualize multi-beam data holdings archived at the DCDB as a grid, and to see the full coverage of data without first having to download and grid the data themselves. This last year, we've incorporated a new feature that allows the user to download an extracted piece of either the multi-beam mosaic or the multi-beam mosaic hillshade. After you've specified your area of interest, the download data link will be activated and you can extract and download the data from um, in a GeoTIFF format. Our CSB-specific enhancements include uh, continued work on the implementation of an um, additional option for accessing CSB data. 
The traditional way that we serve our data to the public is just by offering the actual flat files. How the data comes in is how it goes out. So we've been working on storing a copy of these data as points in a cloud hosted point store. This allows user to generate bathymetric grids of a given area, retrieve data density information using user specified resolution, and better support the guiding of future data collection efforts. We're also working to expand the CSB point store effort um, to include our multi-beam data holdings as well. And I do wanna point out the uh, text in the red screen or the red text on the screen. Uh, this is still a pilot project at this time. Now there's a lot of work on deck for this year as well. Uh, the current version of the web application AutoGrid, which has actually been around for quite a long time, creates user specified grids from the flat files in our DCDB multi-beam archive. The new AutoGrid 2.0 uh, will run in the cloud and include both multi-beam and CSB point data. The plan is in the future also to um, include single beam and possibly LiDAR in the point store. We continue to enhance our system that supports the CSB geographic filter, which is intended to take into account coastal countries' position on the distribution of CSB collected in their areas of jurisdiction. The updated system will automate the notification process of data for coastal states who have provided a positive response, but request pre-approval of data before the public distribution from the DCDB. And finally, I'd like to speak briefly about how to contribute data to the DCDB. The IHO strongly encourages member states and other organizations to contribute their bathymetric data to the DCDB. We work with data providers to ensure that their data is in the best format for public use, that metadata is descriptive and informative, and to determine the best way to get those data to the data center. Our website provides information on acceptable data formats and resources to assist in packaging and submission of data. And here at the top of the page, you can see a link to our guidance document, which is called the Submitting Marine Geophysical Data to IHO DCDB. This document describes our recommended procedures for preparing bathymetry and other marine geophysical data sets for submission, including guidelines on data formats, metadata information, and directory structure. Now, understanding that organizing data can be quite cumbersome, the DCDB website also provides information and resources to assist in the packaging of data. We offer CRUSPAC, which is a standalone data packager designed to simplify the process for data providers through the use of a simple user interface, pull down menus, the software generates necessary metadata files, and creates straightforward and consistent data packages. And you can find some of the software, this software and more information at the link below. And thank you, Georgie, for popping, populating the chat with all these URLs. So another resource we provide is, of course, us, your friendly data managers. We're here to help, to answer questions, assist in documenting your data, to do whatever we can to get these valuable data archived and made available to the public. Okay. Now that I've discussed the DCDB in a little bit more detail, but before we move on to further discuss uh, crowdsource bathymetry, does anyone have any questions for me? Maybe on accessing data or con um, contributing to the DCDB. Um, I'm also happy to get your information to start a conversation on getting your web services added to the viewer. Yeah, Christy, Kevin here. Um, so cruise pack, just make a note of the cruise pack, is that just on raw data or does cruise pack allow you to package up um, process grids as well? That's a great question, Kevin. Thanks for asking that. Cruise pack is a very versatile uh, software um, and it, it can handle raw, processed products, um, ancillary data types, uh, you know, such as your sound velocity data profiles, things like that. It also handles different data types. So um, we have data users who use cruise pack for water column data uh, as well as track line data. So, so it's a, a really great tool um, and anyone who wants to use it, um, the, the website um, includes a, a user manual uh, with kind of really detailed instructions on how to use cruise pack, but we're always here to help. Um, we're, we're always happy to sit down with a data provider and show them how to use cruise pack if they're not familiar. 
Um, so please, please do reach out if anybody's interested in using Cruise Pack. It just really helps get data into a really consistent format for us. Any other questions? Okay, so, if anyone else has, oh yeah, go ahead. All right, I was just going to comment, uh, Christy, so it looks like you've had a pretty busy year and good to see all those enhancements um, within the DCDB and uh, from a personal perspective, very nice to see the uh, the lens coverage that you've managed to uh, extract since we uh, had, a, had our meeting a year ago, so it's good to see that through there. Um, I did have just kind of a, a, a comment really. Uh, you mentioned that within the DCDB you've got 12% coverage, which is about half of what's in the D, uh, in the GEBCO grid. So, um, and, and you're obviously building all these tools to encourage and make it easier for people to uh, to get data in the DCDB. But uh, yeah, there's um, quite a lot out there, obviously, that that um, can um, uh, be added into the DCDB. Yeah, thanks for that comment, and I, and I absolutely agree. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure everybody um, knows, but it, but just because uh, data goes to the Jebco grid doesn't mean that it comes to us um, a, in the archive. And so, the big question we have to ask the community is is, is are these data being shared publicly? Um, are they available? Are they archived? Are they safe? Um, and and the DCDB is here to do that for you. Um, so. So of course, uh, you know, we we are happy to work with anybody who who would like to contribute, um, not only to the Jebco grid and to CBA 2030, but to but to the DCDB and and have those data archived and made freely freely available to the public. Yes, I guess that's perhaps been a a bit of a um, an issue that. With, with multiple uh, data repositories, people just really understanding um, the the respective roles of each one, and um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And there, of course, is also a, a lag between you know all the different data centers and and um, repositories. So, uh, but yeah, please, please, anybody, feel free to reach out to me. I'm I'm more than happy to work with you on on um, getting your data into the archive. Okay. okay, that sounds great. So yes, we had uh, Christy was down for two presentations, <laughs> so she's doing forty percent of our uh, of the session. So uh, yes, on to crowdsource for symmetry. Thanks, Christy. Thank you so much. All right, moving on. Okay, shifting gears, uh, I'm going to discuss the IHO crowdsource bathymetry initiative and just give you a brief overview and update. The IHO defines CSB as the collection and sharing of depth measurements from vessels using standard navigation instruments while engaged in routine maritime operations. Now, eight years ago, the IHO initiated a collaborative project uh, to enable mariners to collect crowdsourced bathymetry data, recognizing that traditional survey vessels alone weren't going to fill the global data gaps. The IHO formed and tasked a working group to develop an IHO publication that states the IHO's policy towards and best practices for the collection and contribution of CSB. This document is the B12 IHO Guidance on Crowdsource Bathymetry Edition 2.0, uh, which was published in 2019. An updated version, Edition 3, uh, will be shared with IHO member states later this year um, with a request for their approval. Updates uh, to the document include incorporating feedback from operational use and experience, making the document more equipment agnostic, uh, simplifying the document and making it more accessible to all readers, data collectors, providers, and users. In support of the CSB efforts, the DCDB created a data pipeline to allow the public to contribute, discover, and download these data. Now it's important to highlight the value of CSB data, which provides data with scientific, commercial, and research value at no cost to the public sector. It fills gaps where there's very little data, such as the Arctic. It can be useful along shallow or complex coastlines. 
CSB data can help identify uncharted features and assist in verifying chart information, as well as confirm whether charts are appropriate for the, last, uh, the latest traffic patterns. But this is only effective if vessels actually collect and donate these data while on passage. So here I'd like to give an example of how CSB data has already uh, contributed to our community. The Canadian Hydrographic Service used CSB data to update several inside passage charts along coastal routes. A systematic comparison of chart, uh, charted depths less than 10 meters yield improved charted channel depths, data density, and improved um, chart compilation in the areas where uh, they used single beam surveys. CSB data helped prioritize survey areas for the following uh, survey season, and it initiated the publication of notices to mariners. But collecting the data is only half the challenge. Uh, the other half is on gaining the approval of coastal states to allow CSB collected within their waters of national jurisdiction to be made publicly available. And as br briefly mentioned earlier, um, the IHO issued circular letters requesting that coastal nations state their position on CSB data provision. Now to date, uh, 32 countries, those seen here in green, on the map um, have replied positively. And most recently, Australia and Papua New Guinea were um, just signed the letters with a positive reply. And below, you can see the URL. Um, it, it provides more detailed information on the position of these 32 countries. So in response to the feedback from the IHO circular letters, the DCDB implemented and continues to update a geographic filter for incoming data to take into account coastal countries' position on the distribution of CSB collected in their areas of jurisdiction. So here you can see the geographic filter working um, both in the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal, where the data is cut off at the coastal countries' EEZs. Now, globally, this means additional data have actually been filtered out. Uh, these data shown here in red will not be made publicly available uh, or to national or international mapping programs until countries provide a positive response. Um, I would like to point out here that the filter has not yet been updated to reflect the positive replies from Australia and Papua New Guinea. So how do you contribute CSB data today? The DCDB accepts CSB contributions through a network of trusted nodes, such as organizations, companies, or universities serving as data liaisons between mariners and the DCDB. Trusted nodes may supply data, logger, uh, data logging equipment, um, provide technical support to vessels, download data from the data loggers, and be responsible for data transfer directly to the DCDB. And the requirement is um, CSB data must be provided in either CSV format or GeoJSON and capture the minimum requirement of information, which is XYZ and timestamp. We currently have a nice variety of trusted nodes contributing data, um, including two navigational software companies, Rosepoint and Navico CMAP. Uh, Rosepoint customers can enable their electronic charting system log file to record position, depth, and time simply by clicking a button. Then whenever their software and uh, chart catalog is updated, the data is automatically transferred to the DCDB. Navico CMAP is one of our newer trusted nodes. We recently finalized testing of a bathymetric feed between the company and DCDB and plan to have uh, data contributions flowing in later this year. A hardware company we're working with is Farsounder, which designs and manufactures 3D forward-looking sonars uh, for navigation and obstacle avoidance. Farsounder customers are given the option to participate in CSB collection and contribution. McGregor Germany, which supplies Carnival Cruise Lines with Voyage Data Recorders, also provides data. Voyage data, recorder, uh, yeah, Voyage data recorders, the VDRs, are a mandated device for effectively all ships on international voyages. By default, this device is logging depth soundings for uh, mandated shipborne single beam devices. A bathymetric feed was established between McGregor and the DCDB. Last year, we established a bathymetric feed between uh, PGS and the DCDB seismic vessels uh, for PGS. And right now we're working with M2Ocean to finalize metadata content 
and our testing data submissions with data collected by Hydroballs, which are small autonomous bathymetric buoys. Um, we expect data contributions also to begin later this year. Now, the great work that's being led by Dr. Rob Beeman at James Cook University has been discussed many times at many different forums. Um, but over the last few years, Dr. Beeman has distributed data loggers to uh, volunteer vessels using their own echo sounders and GPS sensors along the Great Barrier Reef. These data have been sent to the DCDB, and now that Australia has replied positively to the circular letter, will soon be made available to the public. The IHO CSB initiative is now working directly with the CEBA 2030 project. Um, CEBA 2030 intends to not only accelerate CSB activity around the world with designated funding, but also serve as a trusted node to help in the setup of data collection and in the assembly of data. Their objective is to um, encourage the collection of data in scarce areas and to grow excitement about the CSB initiative. This dedicated funding can be used for the provision of data loggers and installation support where needed. In return, a potential program must guarantee the provision of a staff to hand out data loggers to the community, assist local mariners in setup, and to provide a copy of these data to CBED 2030 for inclusion into the DCDB and the JEBCO grid. CBED 2030 has deployed data loggers around the world. Last year, loggers were sent to the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources, the Institute for Maritime uh, Technology, and the South African Navy uh, Hydrographic Office and the Bureau of Marine Transportation in Palau. While COVID has certainly slowed down the progress of these programs um, from delays in receiving loggers to now trying to roll them out to the community, we are hopeful that the momentum will pick back up later this year. Now, we've already seen this exact slide before, um, but I do want to highlight the uh, the work NIWA is doing uh, in hosting the South and West Pacific CEBA 2030 Data Center and their role in serving as a trusted node for several ongoing CSB projects. Now, I want to do a brief wrap up um, with, a, uh, with the Crowdsource Bathymetry Working Group. Uh, to date, we've met 12 times and hosted one industry day. Our most recent meeting was in March. Um, the mock states shown here in red are active members of the working group, um, but we are certainly looking for more participation. Um, this working group is by far the best way to learn about crowdsource bathymetry. Um, I'd like to highlight the long list of active expert contributors, which include many representatives from hardware and software companies, uh, and also scientists um, eager to collect and use these data. Now, couple that with hydrographic office representatives, and it makes for a very diverse group and very engaging conversation. If you want to learn more about the technology, the progress of ongoing projects and new projects, or if your hydrographic offices have questions about CSB um, data collection or sharing, please consider joining or at least attending uh, the Crowdsource Bathymetry Working Group. In addition to updating the B12 CSB guidance document, uh, the working group invested a lot of energy into improving outreach. Um, earlier this year, we finalized several sector-specific CSB summary guides that were drafted by the working group members and um, expert contributors, and then beautifully finalized by the IHO communications team. And they're now available online uh, for distribution, and I encourage you all to go take a look at them. So how can you become involved? Well, the single most important thing to be done is to have the permission of coastal countries to make the data that is already being collected in areas of national jurisdiction made available to the IHO DCDB for public use. Become involved in the IHO Crowdsource, working, uh, crowdsource Bathymetry Working Group. If you have questions or concerns, if you have any ideas on CSB data processing, data uses, anything, come to the meetings and share them. Um, volunteer to be the next CEBA 2030 funded CSB program and reach out to your coordinator with any questions or to me. <laughs> I'm happy to take any. So that's all I have for you today. Um, please feel free to ask any questions about CSB data. Um, if you know of any organizations or uh, companies or academic institutions that might be interested in collecting or even contributing um, or, or any other questions, I'm happy to take them now.
OK, thanks very much, Christy. Uh, again, invite anybody with questions to put them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll address those. Uh, there's certainly a lot of potential there for the crowdsource bathymetry and uh, good to see that getting underway. Uh, before I hand um, pass over to Kevin's question, you mentioned how people can get involved, but specifically getting access to the actual data loggers to uh, distribute out to potential communities. How do people go about that, Christy? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, Glenn. Thank you for asking that. Um, I, the first thing I would say is just reach out to us um, and and we can talk about, you know, the the, the what you're referring to is the C CBED 2030 specific um, CSP project, which which has funding for that um, and for the data loggers. So. Um, definitely reach out to us. Um, you have my email address here, um, as well as, I believe, at the bottom. Nope, I missed it. Um, the, either way, you can reach out to me um, and or Kevin. I, I know Kevin um, has has uh, my information as well as Jennifer Jenks. So, okay, sure. Kevin, Thank you, Kevin. Your Kev question. Yeah, so it's actually um, a, a statement more than a question, but um, uh, thanks, um, Christy, I think great presentation. Uh, and, and we um, had a very successful webinar series that's just concluded for the South and West Pacific Regional Hydrographic Commission, where we had an entire seminar dedicated to crowdsource bathymetry. And it raised um, some interesting um, questions about exactly what is crowdsource bathymetry, what does it mean? And, and it, there's a lot of confusion out there about what constitutes crowdsource bathymetry. And, and one of the um, the big things that we found within our Pacific's, Pacific region, especially in New Zealand, where we've done a lot of outreach, is um, we're, we're basically targeting anyone with a boat with an echo sounder or fish finder of any size can be can contribute to crowdsource bathymetry. This is not the purview of the big boats or the commercial people necessarily, or the Science Research Institute. We're, we're trying to really outreach to anyone who's got a boat um, and an echo sounder and a little satellite receiver, they can contribute because they're the people that actually get to those hard to reach places that, that there are gaps in the data, especially on the coastal regions. And in the Pacific, they're the people, uh, you know, that there's, it's the it's the small fishermen or the small boat owner, the other people to get out to those outlying atolls um, that the big science research vessels or the big hydrographic survey vessels just don't get to, and, and they really are CSB. I think is really critical, um, and and helping us achieve that hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, Thank, thanks for thanks for your comment, Kevin. It's it's always great to get your opinion on here as well. <laughs> Appreciate it. So um, I don't know. This wasn't actually in the, in, in the uh, seminar, but but we at Nemo, we made a little one minute thirty video um, about crowdsource bathymetry and just showing the data loggers and and just using it on a little boat, just as an example. I was wondering, I might, what I might do. Have we got a bit of time? I think. Have we got time, Glenn? For yes, we, video? yes, yes, we so do. Kevin, I go, think, go ahead. Um, I might go and share this video, uh, and this is what what we've produced um, in the centre. And, and we've um, uh, been making this as our as our um, presentation when we go out to people like um, fishing company, fishing clubs, or small boating clubs, or the um, cruising, the yacht cruising uh, clubs that go out around the Pacific. And this is the video that we show. So let me just share this video, and away we go. Beacon Hill, Beacon Hill. This is new uh, vessel Rockaway. Do you copy? Over. So when you consider that 80% of the world's oceans are unmapped, that makes a, a, a big hole in our understanding of the oceans. So today what we're doing is we are testing and demonstrating some little devices that can be installed on any size vessel from a container ship right through to a little runabout with a fish finder. And what it does is it logs the data from the satellite positioning system and from an echo sounder onto a, an SD card or a memory device that can be shared to the CB2030 project. Each blink tells you that that's actually a snippet of information coming from one of the devices. So that tells us that it's actually receiving the data and logging. Even right now, it looks flat, but it's not. There's some heights and, and lows and troughs and peaks. 
And that all makes a difference to the way the ocean uh, works and how life exists on the ocean. Here we go, it's coming oh, up now. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. These variations in the seafloor actually matters because that's where we see there's life. And um, also, say this is in a shallower area, that thing can be actually a danger to navigation. And through citizen science, this information can be open to the public for everyone to be safe. The biggest motivation we find for people wanting to participate is the fact that they can become researchers of their own right. They become their own scientists and do their own science and participate in something that is truly global and really will be quite revolutionary in the way we understand and explore our oceans. True citizen science, you are the scientist. And I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, thank you for indulging me in that little video, and um, you know, the, uh, and it's good to see higher in front of a camera too. Um, so, a couple of take-homes to the audience: uh, crowdsource bathymetry is a big deal, and CB2030 does um, have data, those data loggers. We had examples of them on the video, um, and and we can we can send them out to anyone who's interested in, in attaching them to their boat. Uh, we can work with uh, anyone who's um, who who thinks they want to contribute to this. Um, both as a means of putting the loggers out, but also as, as a recipient of the data. And we can do the data conversions into those formats that Christy does. So we can be the trusted node um, that can share the data with, uh, with the IHO DCDB. And the other take home message is that if your country wasn't listed um, on that map, one of those green countries on the map, um, as being a country that signed the IHO letter that allows uh, citizen science bathymetry to be um, freely distributed, then I encourage you to go to your um, hydrographic office and just say, can you please, um, you know, try and get them to sign that letter and so we can really share uh, that data with the rest of the world. Uh, thank you very much. OK, thanks, Kevin. Um, is, is it possible for that video to be shared more widely? Uh, yeah, it's on Vimeo. What I'll do is I'll put the link on Vimeo um, and on chat and the people okay. can download it. All right, that's great. Thank you very much. OK, uh, let's move on to the next presentation in this section. So uh, next up we have Juliet Kinney. She's a multi-beam mapping and data research analyst at the North Pacific Regional Data Centre for CBED 2030. And she's going to give us an update on the activities of that data center. So over to you, Juliet. Can you guys hear me? See me? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. And, can I can see, and I can see, I can see your slides. Thank you. All right, excellent. All right, so I'm gonna give you an overview for the Arctic and North Pacific Ocean Regional Center's um, efforts in the North Pacific. All right, um, so okay. the map on the left shows the, the various data set sources we incorporated in the 2022 grid. There's the Northwest Passage Huey 2021 data that was collected and processed by Seatown folks in the Coast Guard vessel. Uh, there's the Sail Drink Hawaii data. There's the five deep pressure drop Caledon Oceanic data. Um, uh, there are several Nautilus cruises, which you may have heard about Aaron yesterday. Um, and then there's China's, China's Skepin data, a tiny bit there. Uh, we also incorporated the revised GMRT 4.0 grid. And then we identified several other data sets. There was several surveys on Pangea and at least 28 multi beam data sets on NCEI that get to be processed. Um, so we haven't incorporated those yet. So we look to do those in the future. Uh, one of the things we spent time on was trying to process single beam data from NCEI with the hopes of bringing that into the next grid. Um, so Michael Boganco spent a lot of time trying to filter through the data and make sure we had actual data and not or um, in some cases we we're accidentally given sub bottom files um, in addition to the actual single beam echo sounder data um, and trying to process that um, trying to bring in a nice grid so we're still working on that 
Uh, but hopefully that will be a nice improvement in the future to the North Pacific grid. Uh, the other thing we've spent a lot of time on is uh, transitioning from a mostly a GUI approach to more of a script based approach to making our, our grid for the North Pacific. Uh, mostly using Esri's BIS. So uh, we've created Python scripts to utilize the archive symmetry extension to be able to quickly rebuild the BIS um, and keep all the settings that we want or tweak them as we may want to improve each version. Uh, I did a lot of metadata um, and the BIS schemas to import more information. Um, there have been a lot of challenges with trying to do that. Uh, getting the metadata um, and finding it, it's difficult um, in some cases. Trying to match schemas and the actual spellings of things and bringing that in a systematic way is difficult. Um, a lot of places refer to agencies in different ways. Um, the scripting has to be in Python 2 for ARC 10, which this is in, and ARC Pro is Thankfully, it takes uh, advantage of Python 3, but that means we're using two different Python environments and sets of code uh, to get things done. Um, hopefully, we're looking forward to NCI's uh, upgrades to its uh, database and dissemination system because a lot of information now is kind of hard to uh, discern the actual all the contributors to an individual data set, like who processed something if it's a more final product versus the raw data, like there may have been many people involved, not just the individual ship. Um, so that can be difficult to track down. Um, we were kind of hoping that uh, some of the complexity, feature complexity issues um, where ArcMap and this kind of crash um, would be resolved by script, using scripts, but that didn't really help, unfortunately. So um, sometimes things are issues of rendering, but I guess this was not a case of rendering being the, the hurdle. Uh, so we've sort the data by, by TID. Um, so multi goes on top as best coverage data. We've added in quality metrics based on things like noise level, sound velocity, uh, how much processing has gone into individual surveys, uh, positional quality. Um, we've added a column to rank overall quality. Um, so if it's a really bad survey, it shouldn't be on the top. Um, so there's better data available. Um, so we've been uh, adjusting these rules and we'll need to do more in the future to really take advantage of more metrics um, to make the best quality grid possible. Um, so now I'm going to overview a little bit of what uh, some of Paul's big efforts, which has been, you can see in these GIS portals. Um, UNHCCOM has a web service um, available at the maps.ccom.unh.edu. Um, and UNH has been, CCOM has been um, serving data for a combination of the ArcGIS Arc GIS server and portal since 2012. Um, so the same back end is used for both internal services and external services. And it hosts a wide variety of mapping services and web applications, including the extended continental shelf data for the US that um, CCOM was involved with, multi and planning tools, and the Gulf of Maine synthesis. Um, Another cool tool, which uh, a little animation here, um, is the data quality assessment um, service. Um, so it's a little application using Esri that allows you to go in and circle flyers or other issues with data and um, draw, draw the little polygons around them, make notes on that um, so that the different data centers can then go back in and edit their data and find these issues. So it's been shared with uh, all the reviewers around the world for each drafts and release of the grid. So it would be the North Pacific grids as well as the entire JEPCO 2020-2022 grids. Um, so it's a really nice tool for being able to collaborate 
and then we would export into a common format, so like KML and Shapefile, so that you can bring that back into your own project and uh, work on the data that way. Um, so another example of what's served on the, on the JS portal are these global visualizations. So there's a example with no vertical ex exaggeration, um, and then there's a five times vertical exaggeration. Um, and then there's global views. Um, so it gives a nice 3D rendering of the whole book you can spin through. So a little animation of how you can pan around and zoom in. Shown in Hawaii. So it's a really nice little to spin around and see the Jetco grid um, and go wherever you like. Uh, another um, effort at CCOM has been a uh, gap filler line planning tool. Um, and this is mostly the work of Paul and Ware in the Viz Lab. Uh, so using existing grids of where data exists. It lets you uh, create lines in parallel with overlap of existing data to try and fill the gaps. So with these estimates of things like distance and how much time it will take, how much overlap there is. Um, so um, and it, right now it's got the global coverage, it's a new by view, it just the data and the native projections with the geographic and polar stereographic, and then it's redisplaying it in locally defined stereographic projections. Um, so, if you want more information on that, that's you'll have to contact uh, Dr. Colin Ware um, to get a handle on, get a hold of a copy of that application. Um, and their web services we've got the bundling all the various uh, other web services and uh, DCB data and NOAA gap analysis, multi facts and all NOAA data um, in one web map on CCOM, but uh, we're still in development stages of trying to figure out how to manage in trying to create a more interactive way to share your plans of where to go uh, and to keep that manageable. And that is all for today. So. Okay, thank you, Juliet, for that update from our neighboring um, data center from, from SORPAC. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Yes, yeah, so. So then, just very quickly, um, Hi has put uh, a link in the chat yes. to um, the web portal, the North Pacific web portal, or the portal that Paul Johnson's developed uh, from the North Pacific Centre. And that's that's an, a pretty amazing site, actually. I do encourage people to um, go to that uh, web map and, and play with it. Um, it's, a, it's a very uh, cool bit of kit. Okay, thanks. Thanks for pointing that out, Kevin. Okay. Okay, thank you once again, Juliet. If um, yeah, you can stop sharing stop your screen sharing. now. I think. <laughs> cool. Okay, uh, the next presentation is a recorded uh, recorded one from Vicky Farini. Uh, who's head of the Atlantic Indian Ocean Regional Data Centre for CB 2030. And uh, this will be an update on uh, the work that they've been doing in their data centre. So if you could play the video, please, Haya. Hello, my name is Vicky Farini, and I am the centre head of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans Regional Centre for CB 2030. And I'm going to give you a brief update about what we've been doing over the past year. We're based at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is part of the Columbia University Climate School. Just to give you a sense of the region that we're focused on, the Atlantic and Indian Oceans region 
is about 140 million square kilometers, which is roughly 39% of the global ocean. You can see the delineation of the area or the region in this map. EEZs cover about 38% of the region, and the region is bounded by 117 countries on six continents. Before I get into uh, the update, I wanted to first acknowledge my regional team or our regional team. Uh, as I said, I'm the center head. Um, Frank Nietzsche is a research scientist who works very closely with us and offers both uh, seabed mapping, mapping experience and also GIS expertise. Tina Martin, who's an alumnus of the Jebco Nippon Foundation training program, is one of our data managers. She focuses on the Indian Ocean. She is originally from Madagascar. Haley Drennan is a data manager that also works with us, who's focused on the Atlantic Ocean. And John Morton is an applications developer who helps us with various technical aspects of the work that we do. I'd also like to acknowledge the, I think it's 13 students who've worked with us over the years. Um, some of these have been um, Nippon Foundation Jebco training program students doing lab visits with us, and others have come to us in the summers between their semesters or their years at school to work with us processing data and integrating it into the data products that we're building. I won't read you all their names, but I've listed them here. It's a real pleasure to have them come and work with us and to help have them help us build the CBID 2030 products and get the word out about the project. Some recent highlights of regional engagement. Uh, typically, we participate in scientific conferences, webinars. Um, we've convened webinar series. We're very engaged with recent uh, regional hydrographic commission meetings and IOC regional meetings and various other events. So I've put some logos of various events that we've participated in this year. We're really trying to extend our reach further across the region. We have a lot of engagement over the years with different projects and communities in the Atlantic Ocean. And we're really trying to focus our efforts to extend more deeply into the Indian Ocean to connect with more folks in that part of the world. Uh, just as an example of sort of a highlight of regional engagement um, with one community, the Mesoamerican and Caribbean Hydrographic Commission uh, partnered with IOC Carib. Um, we've built a custom web application to highlight data coverage in the region. We've brought in layers that they've provided to show planned surveys. This is shown up in the top image that's got lots of different colors. Uh, we then had a webinar series that we developed uh, together with this group and also in close collaboration with the Seabed 2030 coordinator who was identified for this region, who is also an alumnus of the training program. Uh, the webinar series led to the, de the development of a Seabed 2030 strategy for this community. And we've provided support with them through the development of this strategy. And they have also just led a successful um, bid for an endorsed action as part of the UN Ocean Decade. So this is a really uh, great uh, example of how working together with a community of stakeholders who's really keen to help um, achieve common goals has really paid off and built momentum for that region and that community. I wanted to highlight just uh, the geographic spread of um, countries that have contributed data for the regional compilation that we're building. Uh, so the, there's more than 30 nations from which either groups or individuals or countries have contributed data. This is a really nice example of national efforts feeding into regional and ultimately global efforts. And we're also seeing data contributions from different sectors. So academia and government, as well as industry and also the public with the um, availability of crowdsourced bathymetry data. I wanted to also highlight several regional efforts that we are very fortunate to be able to work with throughout the area that we're focused on. These include various national efforts, for example, in Canada, Portugal, here in the US, also in Australia. Um, there's other national efforts in Europe, which are also included in the EMODnet regional compilation for the EU, um, and also the GMRT compilation that is based here at Lamont that helps to unite various data sets. 
So these different efforts really help us do our job by aggregating data and building data products that we can more easily bring into the compilation that we are building. Much like pieces of a puzzle, um, these are really putting together more coherent areas for us to work with more efficiently. So a big thank you to all of them. The way that we assemble the regional grid that we are compiling is really based on working with gridded data, so raster data. There's an example here showing different kinds of raster data and different coverage and how they come together for a particular portion of the region that we're focused on. We're using the bathymetric information system that's available as part of the ESRI suite. And we really handle different products or different data files that come to us in, in a, a few different ways. If we receive SWATH files, um, we'll review them if they've been cleaned. If they haven't been cleaned, we'll clean and grid and blend those um, in collaboration largely with the GMRT effort and using those tools to help ensure that the data are of very good quality. If we receive gridded contributions in the format of uh, any raster form, geotiffs, grids, uh, NetCDF, bags, those come straight into the BIS as raster components. And if we have sparse data such as ENC data or single beam, including crowdsource bathymetry, we'll grid that data up and bring those rasters into the compilation. All of these rasters, once we're brought in, once they are brought into the BIS, uh, are carried uh, along with those comes a lot of extensive metadata that we curate. And we basically compute a prioritization score based on the data type and the quality of that raster. And that prioritization score is used to effectively layer these different rasters together to build the final compilation or the annual compilation that we put together. So just to show you some progress that we've made in terms of how much of the region has been mapped, this was the state of things with the 2014 grid from JEBCO. Um, some of the first few iterations of the JEBCO release that we've contributed to producing, you'll see that some areas have become better constrained as we step through the different years. So this is JEBCO 2014. This is JEBCO 2019. Now to JEBCO 2020. JEBCO 2021, I think at this point we've gotten very uh, good constraints on which portions of the area or the region have been mapped with direct observation uh, versus those that were um, have some interpolation in them. And now the most recent release of JEBCO 2022, you can see that we're uh, now adding more and more content to the compilation. So we're really pleased with this progress that we've made and again, gratefully acknowledge all the contributions of everyone who's been making data available to help complete this map. Uh, of course, this isn't the full pack picture of how much of the region has been mapped. Um, to really understand this, we have to look at the most recent data coverage, as well as all of the, un all of the known data that exists, but is not yet shared and not yet integrated. Much of that we can access through the IHO Data Center for Digital Bathymetry portal. And then there's a still uh, a big question mark of unknown data that is still out there that we don't know about and is not yet shared. And we're really trying hard to constrain that question mark so that we have a good understanding of all the data that exists so that we can more efficiently and effectively fill the gaps in the region with um, opportunities that arise. So that's my update briefly for you. Um, I just wanted to point out that in our center, uh, we really focus on a few different themes as we think about accelerating toward 2030 and achieving our goal. Data sharing, of course, is a big piece of that. Technology innovation, opportunistic data acquisition, um, but really uh, two of the key points here are sharing knowledge and building capacity. Um, I think, uh, it's really important to all of us in our group to really focus on sharing our expertise and our knowledge and help build this community that can work together to complete the map. Uh, I also wanted to just point out briefly that we have a meeting uh, much like this one coming up for our region uh, toward the end of this month. There's a link here on the screen if you or anyone that you know would be a good candidate to attend the regional meeting focused on the Atlantic and Indian Oceans please do register. We'll be releasing an agenda for that in the next few days. And we look forward to 
uh, talking with any and all of you as opportunities arise. Uh, feel free to reach out to us at the email address on the bottom of the screen there. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, that was a great uh, presentation from from Vicky uh, on the Atlantic Indian Ocean Regional Centre and at the end there was um, links to get in contact with them and also uh, the uh, information about um, the meeting, upcoming meeting that they're holding that is similar to the one that we're having at the moment. As I said, that was a recorded presentation but if you do have any questions, you could either reach out directly to Vicky or uh, if you wish to pop them in the chat and we can pass them on to her. OK, so our last presentation in this session is uh, by Chris Rolfsfimmer, an associate professor at the University of Queensland. Uh, he's going to tell us about the Allen Coral Atlas, which is mapping and monitoring the world's coral reefs. So over to you, Chris. Hello, do you hear me? Uh, yes, we hear you. Good, and you and, see me? <laughs> and I can see your video, yes. Uh, good, and you see the presentation? Mm, we did briefly, but then it oh. flipped back to your video. Okay, good. Wait. Feed. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yes. yes, presentation okay. is there now, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, thank you all uh, for attending this conference and uh, and listening to my um, spending time to listen to my talk as well. So my talk will be on the Allen Coral Atlas, where I'm the lead on the mapping component um, for the for the Allen Coral Atlas. And here I present the mapping and monitoring of the world's coral reefs, which is done by the Allen Coral Atlas. Um, the vision that we uh, followed, as, as stated here, is a result of a uh, co-partnership between the co-funding organizations that you can see below. The project has been funded by uh, Paul Allen's philanthropic organization, Vulcan. Uh, the idea to, to respond to this vision is by uh, creating maps, uh, geomorphic, benthic and depth, for the world's coral reefs, creating a monitoring system for the turbidity and bleaching, and integrating those data sets through, via the web portal and taking care of engagement. And that's where I will talk about in this presentation. So in 20, 2021, we completed the first version of uh, the geomorphic and benthic maps of all coral reefs. It is the highest thematic and spatial detail map of any global, uh, global map of any ecosystem at this stage. The mapping approach, the philosophy that we had was that we wanted to have an approach that is consistent and repeatable and automatic using global categories that we could apply uh, everywhere, so as good as possible, and that the data would be open accessible, but also the methods um, and scripts that we created. The, the mapping is focused on the waters 10 to 15 meters deep and not, not deeper. So it's, it's really, really shallow water, especially listening to all the talks here at the conference. The data can be downloaded by anybody uh, anywhere in the world um, using the Island Coral Atlas. It's uh, online. Uh, you can select a reef and get uh, statistics of that reef, but you can also download the data behind it as well in various formats. And if you see anything, please provide feedback. It's an important point. So what did we map? So I focus on the mapping first. So we mapped the geomorphic zones from 0 to 15 meters using looking at lagoons, reef flats, reef crests and slopes as some of the major categories. And then we looked at the benthic cover types up to 10 meters due to the ability to differentiate features, looking at algae, rock, rubble, sand, seagrass and corals. But that was the main focus of the mapping. To do that, we uh, of course wanted to have knowledge about what we can see underwater uh, and what's present there. And we'll, although I love to go to every reef in the world, that's not possible. So we, uh, and then of course COVID came in as well. Uh, so we relied on getting field data from various sources. 
this field data was uh, interpreted by my team and to create reference data points. So we had about over 2 million reference data points that are used for training and validation of the mapping process. The, the existing maps and field data were created by approaching or collected by approaching over 1000 individuals, uh, finding their contacts via the internet or uh, papers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and we received over 500 data sets of different areas. All those data sets had different sources uh, of how they were collected. Some were just observations, other were uh, drones, so a variety of information. And one of the approaches we trained several people in was the geolocated photo quadrants, where we received over 500,000 photos of 20 different regions. Um, throughout the world. So for the imagery we used over 2 million scenes uh, from which we in this case used the planet DOF scenes of the 170 sensors um, which has a pixel size of 5 meters um, roughly. We created a low tide mosaic uh, for the mapping. So we, we, we found all the imagery for a year's period that were clear, were good and were collected at low tide and made a mosaic of that for the different regions. We use Sentinel data to derive relative depth of you, uh, and uh, also to uh, um, inform the monitoring, bleaching and turbidity system, the beta versions. So how did we map? Well, we used the knowledge about reefs, our classification scheme, as I mentioned before, that we published. Uh, together with the field data, then the planet of low tide mosaic, the central depth, but then we also used uh, wave models and slope. And the JEPCO layer, for instance, played an important role with assessing the areas uh, of shallow water in the world to, to, to derive the mosaics. And then we created reference data sets. All this data was then processed in a Google Earth Engine uh, online processing routine by dividing the world in 30 mapping regions and each region was treated uh, on its way. We had uh, for each region several um, scripts set up uh, and it, those scripts, the main ones were data ingestion and also segmentation because we not only focus on the individual pixel values but also on the the, the objects, the, the groups of pixels and how they texture and color is. And in that mapping process, we use the depth, the slope and the waves as well, which all went into the random forest classifier using the training data as well. And that resulted in a raw map. That raw map was then cleaned up using an object based analysis based on rules that are derived from our classification scheme. And then, of course, followed by an accuracy assessment. So in 20, 2021, it was completed. And since then, we have improvements based on ongoing research, but also based on feedback that we received. Or uh, we, for some regions, we had funding uh, and still have funding to get uh, to work with the local experts to get specific feedback. Uh, and those feedback is all those improvements are now slowly applied. That resulted that, for instance, the, uh, here's an example of Fiji, where you can see that uh, on the left, the 2021 geomorphic map, and on the right, the 2022 geomorphic map. And you can see that we significantly cleaned up, especially the deep and turbid water areas around uh, countries. And Fiji is a, a very nice example where that happened. Another example is that we uh, learned through our ways that some benthic classes were misclassified. So, for instance, waves were identified as sand, and sand usually doesn't uh, come on reef crest because it's too high energy. So, we were able to apply rules to, to clean that up as well. As a result of that, we are also now in the process of creating a new reef extent for the shallow reefs. Uh, roughly using the geomorphic classes up to 15 meters, which you have, plus a neural network derived for the deeper classes. And that resulted in the red layer uh, here, with on top of that the unit layer, where the unit layer is a result of different mapping approaches uh, that are 
uh, all combined into one layer, uh, which is the most valuable layer at this stage. Um, and the Atlas layer will provide a very good um, add-on to it. As a result of that, we're now able to get a better idea of the composition uh, of the reefs globally. And Mitch Lyons, one of the key developers, is uh, submitted just a paper for Nature, which will focus on the an analysis of our, our findings. And here I show you a, a quick analysis of the data uh, assessment for reef extent, but also the coral habitat. Uh, within the Pacific Islands. And one of the things you can see that the coral reef class, the shallow coral reef class has, in, um, I want to say has increased, but in our mapping has mapped more area than uh, previously mapped for UNEP. Which is what is another thing that is important. For the first time, we are actually able to do an estimate of what we would call coral habitat, coral algae plus rock areas where you expect coral to be. Until now, it was previously not possible to get that kind of information. So we get an increase in areas mapped through the coral reef class. Next to the mapping component, the data used for the mapping component was also used as input for the Atlas monitoring system, which is based on, this, it's still a better version and it's based on a central two imagery. There's two components, the coral bleaching component, and the turbidity the compound, where the coral bleaching compound uses the NOAA sea surface temperature data to find out moments that there is no bleaching expected and it's normal, uh, low temperatures, uh, to get the baseline. And then uh, look when there's high uh, hotspots, um, great anomalies, higher temperatures, to basically compare those mosaics to each other and look at the differences in brightness and then relate that to only the areas mapped as coral uh, to see uh, if there's any changes and any areas bleached. Uh, similarly, a turbidity model is uh, being created by Lee et al, where a um, quarterly uh, bathymetry will be published on the Atlas website soon as well. Then additionally, we're integrating all those data sets on the website. Uh, that's integration of the maps that we created, the geomorphic and benthic maps, the bleaching monitoring tool, but also the NOAA sea surface temperature data, the maritime boundaries and the marine protected areas. And the users of the websites can now uh, do analysis of uh, how much coral cover or algae, uh, sorry, coral cover, geomorphic zones or, or coral types benthic cover types there are within those uh, geomorphic zones, providing additional tools for the public, but also managers to work with. As a result of that all, um, the Atlas itself has now significant impacts. And I added in the, um, the chat some, some websites to have a look at, and one of them is the story maps, where are some examples of all the impacts that the Atlas has had till now. Um, so, uh, when we look at that impact and did some analysis of the last year's work, we find that there are around 71 cases, there's several cases of marine spatial planning, ecological surveys, uh, risk assessment, restorations and rich to reef, where all the data sets on the Atlas have been used to support those projects. Um, and we got really positive reviews back from people with uh, UN, the UN on working with those data sets. So an example is, for instance, that for um, Vanuatu, the countrywide analysis was done uh, to identify the risk and looking at monitoring locations. And they used uh, the, the habitat maps, the bee leaching system and the turbidity map um, monitoring system as well to support um, that work, although the turbidity monitoring, they downloaded the, the, the data for it. So summarizing uh, in short is that um, in 2022, September, we, there will be an updated version of all the maps, geomorphic and bending maps, and also a reef extent for the world's coral reefs, uh, up to 15 meters depth. And again, it's very shallow compared to most of the work we've been talking about. 
Um, the updates are based on research and design, but also feedback with local experts. And um, we are still working on developing the dynamic monitoring and bleaching monitoring of bleaching and turbidity system. And the turbidity system should go online soon as well. Um, the data sets are now integrated with various problem, uh, various um, projects and uh, resulting in impact, which I think one of the main advantages of the Atlas is that all the data is publicly accessible, the, the scripts are open source and anybody can uh, review it. Uh, and use it at global to local scales. Obviously, the, for instance, the work uh, Pat Collins did, did at the Palau uh, with the high resolution mapping, that's, that's a really impressive work. And that's an example of where higher resolution mapping can provide even more uh, information uh, of reef systems. Um, but it's not always doable at a global scale. So the Allen Oral Atlas shows here that we can advance the capability for conservation and management using uh, the products that come from the Atlas. So I thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please uh, email me or uh, send an email to the, the Atlas team. Um, and yeah, let me know. OK, thank you very much, Chris. That's uh, yeah, a very interesting project you've been involved in. And good to see that uh, everything is in open access information. And uh, clearly that Atlas is going to be very valuable for the future. So um, you your, your title mentioned about monitoring. So I was thinking about a, uh, a repeat or an updated version of the Atlas. So you've mentioned that uh, version two is about to come out. What yeah. what will be the anticipated repeat cycle for uh, further reviews and updates? Have you got any idea? Um, well, that's of course depending on funding. And right. in, in this case, it is it's very unique. I would say that one organization funded this whole project already, um, which is Falcon, uh, uh, Paul Allen's philanthropic organization. And um, of course, with support from the, the co-founding organizations, but we are now working to find uh, co continuing funding to uh, continue certain components of the Atlas. But at this stage, version two is the the, ver the last version, and not sure if we get an updated version or not. Okay, thanks, Chris. Does anybody else have a quick question? No, it seems not. Okay, so that uh, brings us to the end of the presentations uh, in this session. So I'd like to thank all the presenters for their time and effort in contributing to this meeting. Um, we're about to have a break, but uh, towards the end of the meeting, uh, we have an open forum and I do have one slide to show for that uh, open forum, but unfortunately I have to leave for another uh, commitment. So I'd just like to um, grab a moment of your time, uh, share my screen with one slide before we take the break. <coughs> okay, so here in New Zealand, we identified that there was potentially a lost opportunity every time a research vessel transited our EEZ without collecting bathymetric data. And New Zealand's Marine Science Research Consenting Agency has agreed that a marine science research consent application is not required for collecting transit data. So therefore, it is now easier for vessels to collect bathymetric data during transit. So a request from Land Information New Zealand to activate the vessel's seafloor mapping system is sufficient to enable transit data to be collected for inclusion in the GIBCO grid through CB 2030. 
So we'd like to ask that any researcher likely to transit New Zealand's EEZ to get in touch with us at the email address shown on the slide for further information and a request to collect data. And finally, hydrographic organisations in other coastal states are encouraged to approach their UNCLOS Marine Science Research Consenting Agency to see if a similar arrangement could be agreed to make it easier for more bathymetric data to be collected. So that's just an example of um, something we've set up recently. Uh, that others might be able to um, to follow that as an example. Okay, so we'll draw this session to a close and um, yeah, we've dipped a little bit into the 10 minute break. Uh, so I'd invite everybody back here at half past and thank you very much for your attendance. Right, uh, thank you everybody. Um, if it's like me, you've just raced off and got your cup of coffee. Um, and so we're back into the, the meeting um, and we'll kick off uh, now. So um, next uh, on the agenda is uh, Dave Crossman, who is um, from IIC Technologies, um, who is uh, very active in the Pacific region um, for a variety of, uh, variety of projects. But I should also like to shout out that, um, that as a centre, we use IIC technologies a lot too for um, purveying of what I call data, data archaeology, um, the digitisation of, of fair sheets and, and old paper um, charts um, that actually have provided a, a valuable source of uh, bathymetric information um, that we use for CB2030. So um, without further ado, I'd like to pass the, uh, the uh, bat on, on to Dave, um, who's going to be talking about uh, tailored SDIs for uh, regional small island nations. Over you, Dave. Thanks very much, Kevin. Appreciate the introduction and the shout out. I'll just share my screen and uh, push straight into it. So can we see that OK? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Well, thanks everyone for the opportunity to speak to you. And as um, Kevin rightly said, I'm going to talk about um, spatial data infrastructures um, specifically tailored for small island nations. And the uh, example that I'm going to use is the the uh, pilot, the first one that we have built, which is for Nui. Um, so in the time that I've got available, I'm not going to dive, dive too deeply into the technical side, um, but instead just give a high level overview of the what, how and why. So. Um, this is what I intend to cover, um, focusing on Nui's situation, so the scope and purpose of the request, their situation, the requirements that were derived, the Nui EIMS as an outcome, and then a few uh, overview comments at the very end. Um, so we were approached by uh, the Nui government having done some training for them, and uh, we were asked if we would provide them with a um, spatial data infrastructure or a database system. And this was the statement that they uh, gave us. So a number of those words were taken from the discussions that we had had. Um, they referred to it as an environmental information management system, which straight away indicates that it's more than just an SDI. But essentially what they wanted the function, uh, they wanted the ability to pull together their data, have some functionality with it and be able to utilize it. Um, they also wanted it to be accessible by mobile applications. Um, they wanted a geo portal built in and they also wanted to be able to integrate QR code um, systems so that it could be used by the tourism department. So we um, accepted the contract and the first thing we did was um, have a talk to them about their current situation. And as they described it, they had no national data store. Um, the data that they had, both terrestrial and um, bathymetric, was disparate in that um, they didn't really know where it was or what it was in some cases. Individuals were doing their best to manage the data, but often it was in um, hard drives and top drawers or on personal um, systems or on government systems that weren't um, uh, integrated across um, multiple agencies. Um, there was no uh, government infrastructure around um, data management, so they had no hardware, software, and they had limited training. Um, 
they held minimal data. And what I mean by that is um, they were aware that there was a lot of data that had been gathered over new way by um, environmental agencies, mapping entities um, and other uh, agencies, but very little of that was actually held within new way. Um, they actually didn't know what the extent of the new way data holdings was. Uh, they had an idea of some of the types of data that was out there, but they had no full understanding of the, the um, breadth of it. Uh, they had an inability to access or manage the data. There was very limited data sharing. So what tended to happen was data was received by one department within government and then not passed to others. And in fact, in some situations, there was some protectionism going on. So some departments didn't want to share their data because um, they didn't feel that the others were sharing it with them. Um, a lot of their data is held in hard copy format, um, so not even digital at this stage. And as a result of all of those things, they had a very limited ability to derive the benefit from the data holdings that they had, some of which is exceptionally good. So the two um, images there are um, imagery that was provided from an SPC uh, managed uh, LIDAR data capture. So it was terrestrial and bathymetric LIDAR data um, over all of New Way. So fantastic data. So um, first thing we did was to uh, develop the breadth of requirements. So we had some uh, initial requirements that were dictated from the contract. Um, however, we did a lot of stakeholder engagement. Now, normally for um, this sort of project, and in fact projects, you know, 10, 20 times larger than this, we would have six or seven stakeholder engagement meetings with different stakeholders. Um, it is fair to say New Way was very engaged. Um, I think we had 24 stakeholder meetings and that covered almost every government department. And I've listed some of them there. Um, but in addition to that, uh, it was with uh, the, the community leaders from each of the village villages, um, environmental entities, NGO, commercial entities, telecommunications entities, and a whole lot more. So it's fair to say that there was a lot of really strong buy-in. And we basically went through and captured all of the information that we could from them during those discussions. And we captured them as epics. Um, from that, we generated a list of requirements and we prioritized them and submitted them to New Way as a um, recommendation on what was most important through to what was least important and prioritized the development of that. Um, but the bottom line was, is um, what they were after was, was a silver bullet resolve for all of government to manage all of their data and information. So it was kind of a, an SDI plus, plus, plus. They wanted to have, hold, build, manage, serve, analyze, share, visualize, and report spatial, but also non-spatially enabled data, including things such as images, video, sound bites, art history, culture, and also things like sensitive medical information. They wanted to be the recognized new way data repository, so everyone gravitated to it as the the source of information, but also the place to put their information. Um, it needed to allow, allow utilization primarily by New Way and government, but they also wanted full access and buy-in from the community, NGOs, um, and the off-island diaspora and general public. And we also had to win community buy-in. And to be fair, that wasn't hard. They were, they were well engaged right from the outset. And every meeting they came up with a fantastic lot of things that they wanted and you can see I've got 19, the top 19 there. So you can see central data repository, data access, data discovery, visualization, e-library, data export, and, and it goes on to things like village portals, community messaging systems, linking to other databases, data sharing, QR codes. I mean, often the people that we engage with didn't know the right terminology, but they sure knew what they wanted out of the system, which was great. So what we did was proposed a solution, which was um, a web based application, which would manage and visualize their spatial data and non spatial data. Uh, it had to be accessible by uh, mobile applications and um, it should be able to consume spatial services. We um, suggested and they accepted that we should ensure it was OGC compliant in all cases and utilize things such as WMS and WCS, but we should also leave it existing technology and I'll show you some of those soon, but the key technology that we we're going to build on was IIC's Nautilus Cloud Infrastructure, which is a, a cloud-based geospatial infrastructure that we've developed to serve much larger clients, but upon which we can build these sorts of web-enabled web -enabled services. Um, 
QR code integration. Um, they also needed a nationally based infrastructure, uh, sorry, nationally owned infrastructure. And we had long discussions about whether we should have a physical infrastructure or a cloud based infrastructure. And there was a lot of pros and cons on each. And eventually they determined that the cloud based infrastructure would be what they wanted. Um, they also needed the ability to visualize um, the information, but also we needed to provide training not only for all of the users, but also to allow self-sufficient ongoing support beyond the term of the contract with IIC. Um, I mentioned we were levering existing technology and that was to keep the cost down as low as possible. So rather than creating bespoke resolve, resolves, we lent into um, recognized, accepted and industry best practice solutions. So the outcome. Um, I'm not going to go onto the live system. I've just got some screen grabs. That's the um, that's the home page that you land on when you go in. And essentially, it's an easy to use portal. Um, it's web or smart device um, acted, um, accessed. Uh, we have managed user access. So there is sensitive information like health and medical data. So depending on the login profile that you have, you'll have either access to everything or access to um, specific areas as well as the public data. The intent is to make as much data available as possible. Um, this provides access to the full consolidated NUE data holdings. Um, you can access the data directly or you can go in through grouped data portals. So for example, you can go in through the community page, select your village and it'll jump through to all of the data sets that are specifically relevant or cover your, your um, village. Um, it also has links to other relevant data holdings and websites. Um, we have the ability to search and view all of the available spatial data. So it's obviously terrestrial and bathymetric and imagery. Um, you can upload and download data sets um, and you can also undertake data capture. This is really key because they're really keen to undertake citizen science. So they wanted um, the students and the communities to be able to capture key information on meteorology, biology, horticulture, uh, and those sorts of things, but also the organisations need to be able to capture things like the key infrastructure and their own um, records so that um, it was available to them. And they wanted the students to be actively involved, and I'll touch on that shortly. Um, it's got full GIS functionality, so um, you've got the ability to visualise all the data, load and view different data sets, overlay, um, manipulate and interrogate the data. Uh, generate your own analysis and reporting, but we also have tailored reporting and tailored analysis because there are a number of um, the government entities that had requirements for reporting. And so the intent is that we will provide them the bespoke analysis and reporting for them to save them having to do it the long, the long hard way. Um, it also means that people who are less GIS competent are able to utilize the system and obtain good effect from it. So, so what are the outcomes? So we have built and are about to release the new A EIMS, which is a spatial data infrastructure plus plus. Um, it is all of government supporting, but it also supports community, NGOs, environmental and public entities. Um, we've got managed multi-level access to ensure that specific data sets are protected. Um, and it manages numerous data formats, so not just spatially enabled data, but also things such as the imagery and, uh, sorry, the uh, video files and things like that. Uh, it's got the ability to upload data sets or to capture data, and it also has the ability to provide uh, management analysis, visualization and reporting. The system um, promotes open data and maximizes the use of the open data standards and freeware. And one of the cool uh, initial wins for this project was um, we uh, during the stakeholder engagement, we um, collated all of the spatial data held by each of the stakeholders. And then we reached out to other um, data holders, such as Land Information New Zealand, the New Zealand Defence Force, and a few others who we knew had new way data and they had provided it previously. Um, but some, there was some other data sets that hadn't been from other entities. And we captured that information and we immediately increased the new way data holdings by 400%. Um, we do have a full community buy-in. One of the really cool things is um, the education sector are really keen to engage and embrace this technology. So their intention is to build their curriculum around the EIMS and the information within it. And even great things like as five and six year olds are going to get the kids to 
look at this information and come up with environmental plans and they'll record it um, digitally and as a movie file and they'll upload it onto the EIMS. And then four or five years later, they're going to go back to those same files and have the students review their data and find out whether the kids have actually adhered to their environmental plan that they'd proposed and things like that. Um, the system raises the awareness of the data that's available, but also the value that can be derived from the data. Um, we give them the ability to um, derive benefit from the existing data that they have and also the newly provided data, the data that's coming in um, reasonably regularly. The, one of the really cool things for me, and I'm, I'm sure you can hear that I'm quite excited about this, is that um, the Nui culture history and language is actually listed by UNESCO as an at-risk entity. So this system will actually help capture, hold and retain for, well, hopefully indefinitely, um, Nui's language, history and culture, which I think is an incredible um, uh, outcome for uh, an SDI. Um, so that's basically all I really wanted to touch on, but the two key takeaways from this, I think, are that um, the issues raised by um, Nui are not an uncommon. I deal with most of the Pacific Island nations um, for training and other activities, and almost all of them suffer the same issues around um, lack of infrastructure, lack of ability to manage the data, and therefore lack of ability to really derive the benefit from the data that they actually want in order to generate things like resilience and future planning and all of those good sorts of things. Um, so as a result of that, when we developed this SDI or EIMS, we did it in such a way that it can be easily replicated to other, no, I said Pacific Island nations, but it can actually be any nation um, who needs this sort of resolve. So essentially we can take the entire system and framework, tailor it for the, the um, nation's culture, motifs, artwork and look and feel, but also tailor the um, bespoke reporting and analysis and those sorts of things and essentially roll it out to these um, Pacific Island nations as a, a very cost effective um, resolve. Um, so look, thanks very much for your time. Um, I, I'm really pleased with the way this project has come out and um, I would love to see it used a bit more widely. So I have been engaging directly with a number of the Pacific Island nations, but also with other entities such as SPC, the Australian Hydro Office, um, even JEPCO 2030 as well, to see if there's avenues through which we can um, look at getting this system sponsored into some of these other nations that have this sort of need as well. So thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. That was an awesome presentation. And, and I can't um, stress enough how um, important to have such SDI um, or SDI plus 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 infrastructures on on these um, island nations uh, because they are really under under resourced and and and, and technology is a bit of a barrier. Um, and, and, and the more countries can take ownership of their own spatial data um, and, and make smart decisions, the better it would be for everybody. And, and also reminds me, um, and, and this was actually mentioned at the UN Ocean Conference that was just happened, that, that we should actually call these uh, Pacific countries large, large ocean states rather than small islands, because these are these are literally large ocean estates. And, and the ocean is so important to the Pacifica people because it's actually ingrained as part of their DNA. I mean, the oceans mean everything to them and we should really recognise the fact. Um, so are there any questions for Dave? Here we go, this one, Pip. Dave, one of, could you see there's a chat, there's a question for you, Dave, on the chat. Can you see that? Yeah, um, well, we've actually completed, the, the question is, when will we be able to see the new A portal go live? So at the moment, we've completed um, the, the creation of the portal, um, but we're running it on IIC's um, Innovation Centre um, system, uh, and we're about to roll it out live. Obviously, we have to release it to new A before we can release it publicly, but we're hoping to be able to do that for them in the next few weeks. Um, but as soon as it's um, made publicly available, we can send that information out. I mean, their intent is that as many people as possible look at their information and add to it. So hopefully within the next month or so, right? Next two to three weeks. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and something else um, I just thought I'd, I'd raise too, um, and I was really happy to see that they're going for an open data sort of policy. And I think there's been a push, certainly within the South Pacific Regional Hydrographic Commission and IHO to go towards open data. And, and that means that um, like new ways data, potentially I'm throwing this out there, um, could go to the DCDB as well. 
Um, I think that's a question for the. We, we'll, I might ask that um, to the New Zealand government actually, and what find out whether they're happy to share that data with the um, the DCDB uh, as well. Um, thanks, Dave. I don't think there's any other questions. Uh, in which case, we will uh, move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, this is a, a pre-recorded video um, from Dilton Sanchez Espinosa uh, from the Ecuadorian Navy. Uh, and, and Nelton will be talking about um, planned surveys within Ecuadorian waters um, and, and support for other entities like CB2030. Um, Nelton is a, is a Jibco alumni, so he's um, well known to the, to the Jibco community. So um, hopefully, hi, you've got his presentation ready to go. And uh, if you can run that, please. Hello to everyone. My name is Nilton Sanchez. I am from Ecuador. I, I would like to say thank you to Haya to let me do this presentation, planet surveys in Ecuadorian waters and support to other entities or projects like Seabed. As I told you, I am from Ecuador. I am a hydrographer and Navy officer. I am former JEPCO student. I am from the year number 10. And I made my training program between 2013 and 2014. I got also my master's degree in ocean mapping at SICOM in 2016. And after my JEPCO training, I took part in several hydrographic surveys in the Eastern Pacific Ocean along and across Carnegie Road about the ocean mapping activities in my country. In 2014, after my EGPO training, I was assigned to the hydrographic, hydrography and cartography department in the Oceanographic Institute in my country. And I was the scientific head of three hydrographic surveys along the north flank of Carnegie Ridge to obtain bathymetric data for the extended continental shelf on board the Ecuadorian hydrographic vessel Orion, and we got we gathered the multibeam data with the multibeam echo sonder Kongsberg EM302. To process the data, we used several hydrographic programs like CARIS, GeoCap, HIPAC, and FLIRMS. About the first hydrographic survey. It was conducted between November and December of 2014 to obtain the foot of a slough in Carnegie Ridge. And we map uh, the data between 2,500 and 3,500 meters of depth. The principal seafloor feature found in this survey was this escarpment area and a submarine valley. Also, it was identified a potential area of massive foil metallic sulfides, and we obtained this data uh, processing the processing it with flares. About the second hydrographic survey, it was conducted between February and March of 2015 in the north flank of Carnegie Ridge between 2100 and 3500 meters of depth. We mapped the same features and we got a better visualization of the deep valley. And we obtained uh, more details about the sea floor composition. About the third hydrographic survey, it was conducted in May 2015 in the north of the second area between 2,500 and 300 meters of depth. As you can see here, we map again the escarpment area, the deep valley, and, and on the water, on the water cliff with approximately 500 meters. Between 2016 and 2019, several hydrographic surveys were conducted in the south flank of Carnegie Ridge and across the El Coco Ridge. As you can see, we identified several uh, bathymetric features like narrow valleys, flat terraces, and scattered sea mounts. For this reason, in 2019, I was assigned as head of the Continental Shelf and Seabed Direction in the Sonographic Institute, and we focused on the data processing to determine 
the extended continental shelf in Carnegie and the Cocoa Reaches. And we got a preliminary identification of no living resources in this area. What were the results? The results uh, until now were the, uh, the, the following. In December 16th of 2020, Ecuador and Costa Rica submitted to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf the first joint submission for the definition of the outer limits of the continental shelf in the north flank of Carnegie Ridge and the south, southern flank of Costa Rica, uh, economy, uh, Costa Rica area with uh, the Coco Ridge. In March 1st of this year, Ecuador and Costa Rica made the presentation of the joint submission in the Commission on the Limits on the Continental Shelf during its 54th session. Also, my country delivered to the Duallos the partial presentation of the outer limits of the continental shelf of the, on the southern flank of Carnegie Ridge. What were the other results? We uh, have a draft of a nautical chart called National Maritime Territory. We are still working in this nautical chart and we will show here the, the extended continental shelf in the north flank of Carnegie Ridge and the extended continental shelf in, in the south, south flank of Carnegie Ridge. Also, we will, we will show the potential areas of uh, extended continental shelf along and across Del Coco Ridge, Del Coco Ridge and uh, Colon Ridge. We also have in, in several websites, especially in ResearchGate, uh, several papers. One of them is about the compilation and, anal and analysis of bathymetric data prior to the determination of the juridical continental shelf of Ecuador. And we are showing here how we gather the bathymetric data in your area, how, how we process this data, and how, how we obtain uh, the, food, uh, the points of the foot of a slope in the continental shelf. What are the planet surveys from this year? We are planning to gather data from Cologne Ridge, uh, which is ubicated, located in the west uh, flank of the Galapagos Volcanic Province. And also we will gather data along and across uh, the Coco Ridge. Uh, this planet survey uh, have the aim to determine the natural prolongation of the Ecuadorian continental shelf, the base of a slope and the foot of a slope along and across Del Coco Ridge and Colon Ridge. Also, to determine the outer limit of the extended continental shelf in both Del Coco and Colon Ridges. Also, to determine the potential existence of non-limit resources. And for this, we will gather bathymetric, geophysical, and geological data. And about the cooperation and support to other entities, we conduct hydrographic surveys between November and May of every year using the multi-beam ecosonde uh, in, uh, on board of hydrographic vessel Orion. We usually conduct uh, the hydrographic surveys during 25 days. Also, we conduct oceanographic surveys between June and September of every year to obtain oceanographic and meteorological data and sometimes a whale, whale watching during 25 days. We can uh, support maximum four or five alumni JEPCO students or any scientific people who is interested to navigate or to do any laboratory visits on board or vessel. Just let me know uh, at, at the, in, in the final, the final uh, page, I will show my, 
my, my email. So we can provide food during the survey period. Uh, we can help with the accommodation before the survey, and we can help also with shuttle to the airport. About lab visits opportunities in Galapagos Islands, uh, we have a radionuclide and infrasound station to detect radioactive waste in the atmosphere and nuclear explosions underground in the seas, in the seas and in the air. We can uh, give you access to real-time data generated by the equipment. Also, we can offer lab visits for monitoring oceanographic and meteorological parameters. Uh, on board or in, on board in the oceanographic so uh, uh, oceanographic vessel series. This is our hydrographic vessel in Galapagos Island, and we can help you to 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 go there. But you must coordinate with me prior to this requirement. But we have some limitations with accommodation. We can help you to stay in cheaper hotels. Uh, but we can help you with the shuttle support. Finally, I would like to remark the cooperation and support to CB23. Uh, in January of this year, the research vessel Presul Drop request permission to gather bathymetric data in its transit between Chile and Mexico. And in my case, I am in working with the general commander of the Navy, and we are uh, we have the the responsibility to give the permission to conduct scientific research. So if there is any vessel who wants to get the gathered data, bathymetric data, you must contact me to obtain this request. This, uh, in this page, you can see my email. And thanks for listening to me, for listening to me. And if you have any question or request, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much and good luck in everything. Goodbye. Yeah, that was um, a great presentation for Nolton actually. And I'm very happy that he's uh, made the offer to uh, host uh, students on board his vessels. Uh, again, that's really good to see um, nations really stepping up and helping with this capacity development across the region. Um, if you do want Nilton's email address, just contact us. We can share it with you. Um, and uh, that was, a, again, that was a great presentation. And we have the privilege of working with him quite a lot. Um, as he alluded to, we, we work together a lot about getting permission for the pressure drop um, to cross uh, through Ecuadorian waters on its transit to collect multi-beam data. Um, and that's the sort of thing that we do. Um, we do a lot of that sort of networking and, and um, outreach uh, at the center between um, various vessels and various agencies as well. And it's, it is a, something that we do offer. Um, I think we'll move next on to the agenda, um, which is uh, a presentation from Hire. Um, about the uh, the South and West Pacific web app that we've been developing. We've had a web app for a while, but um, it's it's had quite a lot of new innovations added to it uh, and a lot of new work done to it. So um, without further ado, I would like to pass on to Haya, uh, and if you can please give us a demonstration of the South and West Pacific web app. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, so I just want to say that um, this is where you can find us and the way to access the web app, app is either you go to Center the South and Pacific and you go to Regional Data Portal and that will get you to this page and if you click on the web viewer um, you I'll just shortcut yeah you get into this page so what you see is that these are the the, the blue ones are the um, Chevco 2020. At, for now, it's Chevco 2021, but we're going to update that to Chevco 2022. And then we also have um, other coverage, multi beam coverage and single beam coverage. Um, these are WMS. Um, 
data sets that we can access from different entities like AVI, we have from NOAA, uh, we also have from Ephraimer and Mariano and all the others. Um, so what we're trying to say is that you can use this web app to um, see where there is coverage if you if you act, if you want to plan um, your transit. Um, you can also use this to let us know if there is a data set that's lying around somewhere that you know um, that they want to contribute to CBET 2030. Um, so let me just um, demo first how you do the route planning or the transit planning. So make sure that you have the layers that you need open. You can change um, transparency and stuff. And then so for the route plan or the transit planning, you enable the route plan layer and then you click this line and add survey line. Which, and then new feature and then say you want to go you do you do you just click and go somewhere so you you don't want to go where there's already um data right to maximize your transit so you just like, either eyeball it or um we're going to add um, distance measuring in this one so you can actually um, estimate better. And then you there right click. And so that's your um, line planning. Um, you can save it. And you can actually edit it as well after that. So you can edit if you want. Um, another thing that you can do is that you can export this line um, as a GeoJSON file. So you just go select. And you see you have one route selected and you go to export to GeoJSON. So whatever it does is that it will give you a GeoJSON file, which is basically the coordinates of the nodes of, 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 of this, of the vertices of the line that you created. So you can import that to your GIS. Um, and um, we would like to tell you that um, whatever you're doing, if you're if you're drawing lines in this, um, it's only you who can see it. Um, if you want to share this, um, you can let us know so we can um, activate the feature that everyone can see it. But but for for security purposes, um, Whoever is doing the editing or or creating lines, you are the only one who's who can see it and who can access it. OK. It's the same thing for. Like identifying survey areas or identifying. Um, data, existing data that you think would be. Can be shared to CBET 2030, so this is the community survey. Um, layer. And you do the same thing. And you highlight the community survey. Say, you know, there's data somewhere here. So there, so it, you can just put any number here. The details, whatever details um, or description of the data. Um, give us your name, give us your correct email address, because otherwise you won't be able to contact you. And you just hit save. And it's the same thing. So it's the same thing. This feature will not be shown to anyone, um, even to us. So you either um, let us know whenever you want to draw some lines or what. You can also, whenever you're making your map, you can use, use this web app to create your own map. You can add data set in your own layer as a file, so you can add a shape file, make sure it is um, a zipped folder. And you can also have, you can also add KML and GeoJSON, but we're not going to do that. 
And then the last thing would be you can print this map if you want to like a have have a ready map, like a quick one that you can show to your um, colleagues. So just do your settings. And you just print. Might take a while, but yeah. Um, at the moment, you can you cannot actually zoom in, so I'll try to zoom in. So you you won't be able to see the the Chabco, um grid, but we're working on that. It's just that we're um running out of credits. <laughs> Oh, OK, I think it will not work because I zoomed in. That's it. OK, again. Hmm. Didn't like it, but what will happen is that um, after that, you'll see uh, an Adobe PDF um, file in here, and then if you double click it, you'll see in an, another browser, another window, that, and that will be your map, and you can download it and save it locally. I don't know why it's not doing it. But yeah, so I think that's, um, if, if, if there is anything or any improvement that you would want to suggest to us, just please reach out, and thank you very much. All right, thanks, Haya. Um, so that basically concludes the uh, the last of the uh, formal presentations and formal talks. Um, on the agenda, we've got time for um, a general discussion, um, and this is more a, a time that if anyone has questions that um, uh, maybe they didn't have a chance to ask over the last three days, or, or if there's any any um, clarification that's needed, um, or any any um, issues that people want to have addressed, or at least um, air their issues, this is the opportunity to do that. Um, if you do have any questions, um, just use the hand up, um, uh, the hand up, raise hand option on Teams. Um, if there's I'm not seeing anything because if there's not, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just um, I'll finish off with some summary slides, um, basically some summary notes of the of of what we've had the last three days, um, and and just a few bullet points about where we're going where we're going as a centre uh, over the next twelve months. So I'm not seeing any. Oh, Christy, thank you, Christy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a comment about um, a presentation on the first day uh, about Jebco. Uh, Dr. Lamarche presented about Jebco, gave us a little bit of history about it and everything, and uh, talked about some of the subcommittees, uh, including TSCOM, which is the uh, the um, ocean mapping subcommittee. And, and one of the things that I noticed was um, uh, he mentioned the Jebco cookbook, um, and I wanted to just give a little update. I have actually taken over uh, the Jebco cookbook as chief editor, and uh, we have since uh, the TSCOM has um, requested that we uh, form an editorial board. In fact, we have a couple of board members here on the call today, including Haya. Um, and so we are working very diligently as a team to uh, revamp the Jebco cookbook and uh, release a new version of this uh, by the end of the year, um, and then also put out a call for new uh, material down the road. So, so the, the cookbook is indeed uh, still being worked on. Uh, the previous editor had retired, and it took a bit of time um, to kind of hand that all over. So I just thought I'd mention that. Thanks, Christy. Um, as, as a question, because I'm on Scuffin, one of the subcommittees of um, Jebco, and, and we're developing, we've got a sort of a cookbook as all. Well. I'm not too sure if you can explain, is the Jebco cookbook, is it inclusive of, of Scuffin? Uh, and for those who are on the call, Scuffin is the um, 
DEPCO subcommittee for undersea feature names. Um, Jeffwa Lamarche did mention that briefly and described it on the first day. Uh, and, and so the SCUFN is a committee of GEPCO that, that basically um, is, a, is the international authority about um, naming features on the sea floor. But as I say, going back to cookbooks, um, I'm not I'm not familiar with, well, I'm not terribly familiar with the cookbook for GEPCO. Is that, how is that related to the other subcommittees? Let me, uh, I, I'll just drop a link in the chat real quick. Um, it's a link to the GEPCO cookbook. Um, and it's actually a, a guide um, to help the public uh, learn how to process bathmetric data. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a very useful guide and it's been historically used by the community for many, many years. Um, and it's been maintained uh, mostly by the same person for many, many years, Dr. Karen Marks, who has retired. Um, and so this has been given over to me uh, and we are going to be, it, it, it ranges in the different topics, gathering data, data cleaning, gridding examples, software overviews, but a lot of it is a bit outdated um, just because the maintenance of such a large document has been quite difficult. And so we are coming together with an editorial board to really revamp the, the document, see what's really relevant, see what needs to be updated. We're in contact with the existing authors right now. We're working with them to update their chapters and we're wanting to bring it into um, a more usable format that's going to be a, a an e-publication um, with clickable links and and uh, you know kind of live references to other uh, important um, uh, things. You know, it, it's it's great to have a, a click by click instruction, but it's not a very evergreen system. So so we're trying to make it so that it, it lasts uh, through the years uh, with with information on how to grid data. So. Oh, that's very good. And actually, I, am, I should be familiar with that document because I have looked at it many, many times. So, yes, yeah, so, so I think that's it. you're saying there's a general call out for anyone listening if they want to help contribute to that. Is that what you're asking? Or? Not not yet. I just wanted to make the comment because I do know that um, uh, part of the, the Jebco community wasn't quite aware of, of these steps that we've been making towards uh, revamping the document. And and I think at some point it had been under the impression that the document was no longer supported, but it is. So I just wanted to make sure that the community knew uh, we are supporting it. And um, and then as as we move forward with the newer editions, we we will put out a call for newer material um, down the road, probably next year or so. OK, excellent. Oh, thanks, Christy. For that. That's really good to good to hear, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, anybody else have anything to contribute or add? OK, so um, the chat will be still going open if you still want to um, add something. Uh, Scaffin, see feature names. Yeah, so actually Serge has made a good point. Um, Scaffin, feature names must be supported by significant CBN mapping. So in terms of Scaffin, and, and this is actually, Scaffin is also a way that we can um, get data for the JIBCO map as well. So to, for anyone to suggest the name for an undersea feature, it has to be supported by um, seabed mapping uh, and that evidence has to be produced to as part of the submission for the committee members to rule on it. But what we have discovered within SCUFN, even though it's a JEBCO um, committee, that a lot of data that has been um, shown to support an undersea feature name actually is hidden in private um, and, and never actually goes onto the SCUFN chart. So Within SCAFN, one of the things that we are trying to get to pr uh, proposers of, of uh, undersea features um, is that they do support uh, their claim by um, giving the data to JEBCO. And I know um, Christy, no, it wasn't Christy, it was Juliet. Juliet mentioned um, one of the contributors of the North Pacific who was China, um, uh, and, and China. Uh, gave their seabed mapping that they used to support the, the claims for the undersea feature names that they named and have given it to um, GEBCRA for inclusion in the map. So the process does work. Um, and so a couple of take home messages here. Uh, if anyone is listening, especially if you have undersea mappings within your national waters, I do highly encourage you to um, get local names onto those features. Uh, and use the JEBCO um, scuff and process uh, to um, get those names uh, um, adopted by JEBCO. And, and the information about how to do that can be found on the JEBCO website. 
um, but also I would encourage um, people also to um, again just share data. Sharing data is, is the key to everything and, and talking about sharing data I think um, Ausseabed and Australian government yesterday for allowing us to share that report um, from Deloitte's that was commissioned for the Australian government that actually looked at the value um, added to an economy by sharing data. There is world documented evidence that by sharing bathymetric data um, to the larger community and to the international community, um, it does generate extra dollar value to the blue economy of nation states. So again, um, if you're listening, I do encourage you to go to that Deloitte report uh, and use it and actually show that to your decision makers and governments um, as a way to try and open up data holdings within within nation, nation states. Um, if there's no more um, feedback, what I'll do is I'll share um, some slides, summary slides or sort of a, a summary of um, sort of the take home messages that we've got as a data center and as Jebco and just um, to inform the audience about what our plans are for the next 12 months. Um, so just just as summary um, progress to date for Jebco, when 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 CBA 2030 started in 2018, the Jibco grid, um, which is the world's most popular um, bathy topo grid of the globe, uh, stood at 6% coverage. That is, out of the entire world map that we have, that people can download, only 6% of the cells actually come from real soundings. Um, right now, as of World Hydro Day 2022 and the release of the Jibco 2022 grid. Uh, that number is now 23.4%, so it's at a significant increase. Um, and, and more to the point, it, it's, an, it's a, an increase from last year, and we, I don't think we mentioned this at the beginning, but from the tw Jibco 2021 grid, that's an increase of 110 million square kilometres, or the area of continental Europe that has been added since last year. So um, there has been a big increase since last year, and we hope to really accelerate that over the next few years. Um, as the world's fleets recover from the uh, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, and just to note, there's still three quarters of the world's ocean floor yet to be mapped. In terms of the South and West Pacific, um, this is just a, a big shout out and a big thank you to everybody on that list who contributed data uh, last year um, for the JEBCO 22 release. Um, everybody on that uh, that list. Um, thank you very much. It's outstanding to see such collaboration uh, with those agencies uh, and we look forward to more into the future. And also uh, these agencies here who have already donated data to Jebco um, that has happened after the release uh, of after the building of the Jebco 2022 grid. So all these um, organizations here have given us data and these will be included in the Jibco 2023 release. Also want to do a shout out, and this wasn't really mentioned before, um, NIP, uh, CBA 2030 has various memorandum of understanding uh, or agreements. Um, we heard briefly uh, uh, that New Zealand um, had an MOA uh, signed um, this time last year, and it was the first MOA signed with a, with a national government for CB 2030. Um, right now, there are some uh, couple of memorandums that are currently being worked through and should be signed very, very soon. The first is with NAMREA, the National Mapping Agency of the Philippines, uh, who have agreed to share all, all their um, data outside the 12 mile zone, or multiple data outside the 12 mile zone, and all ENC data within the 12 mile zone for the Republic of the Philippines. Thank you very much. That's an outstanding um, contribution. And also to the Ministry of Information, Communications, Transport and Tourism Development for Kiribati. Um, they are in the middle about to sign an MOA with um, CB2030 and they've already um, agreed and announced to uh, release all information held uh, within Kiribati to Jebco and CB2030 as well. Uh, and I know there are um, there actually are now 39 memorandum that are currently being worked through around the world. Um, so there's a lot that I probably haven't mentioned that they're not quite aware of within the Pacific region. Uh, CB2030 has uh, a person, Dr. Steve Hall, or Mr. Steve Hall. Um, he is now head of partnerships within CB2030. 
Um, he's the person, if, you, if, if you're if you interested in, in exploring a memorandum with CB2030, he is the person to get hold of. I've got his email address um, there on the slide. Um, either get hold of him or get hold of um, us at the Pacific Centre and we can put you in touch with Steve. Uh, it's, it's a very simple process to go through a memorandum. Um, it's not um, it's just a really an acknowledgement that uh, between CB 2030 and the signee of um, the uh, the um, acknowledgement and agreement to um, share data. In terms of the next 12 months, this is specifically for the centre. Um, we will continue to engage with the Pacific CB community. Um, and, and, and I mean that in the wider sense of the Pacific. Um, not just in the Pacifica region, but also uh, working very strongly with um, in Asia. Um, we are, we have given presentations to the East Asia Hydrographic Commission, um, and the East Asia Hydrographic Commission has um, assigned a CBED 2030 coordinator, um, which will be based in Japan. So we intend to work very closely with uh, that coordinator in Japan and with the community members, the commission members within the East Asia hydrographic community more closely um, to try and get some more data sharing. That's certainly um, a high priority target um, for the next 12 months. Uh, we also recognize that um, the South East Pacific, um, the, the, the West, the Pacific uh, Coast uh, countries of South America, um, we really need to engage more with them. Um, we have been trying to work through the Hydrographic Commission, the Southeast Pacific Hydrographic Commission uh, in South America, uh, but over the last 24 months, um, they have uh, really just been struggling with the COVID pandemic um, and have, um, through lockdown and um, an inability to actually get together to meet. Um, with the easing, hopefully, of travel uh, in South America, we um, really plan to start some really serious engagement with those South American communities. Um, we also intend to work a lot um, stronger with uh, crowdsourced bathymetry and with data loggers. As it's mentioned through Christy, um, CB2030 does have um, uh, access to data loggers that we can distribute. Um, these are data loggers that CB2030 has brought, and, and we can distribute them to anybody who wants them. Uh, there's a couple of examples, the NMEA 183s and NMEA 2000, data loggers, depending on what type of vessel you want to log them to. If anyone out there in the audience is interested in thinking that these are these data loggers could could um, work when, with vessels within their community, please get um, get hold of us uh, and we can talk about how to get those into the field uh, and get them um, logged up. On the other side of the crowdsource bathymetry process too, um, in terms of data coming in from these loggers, we realise that uh, we don't want to put the burden of processing the data into the community unless they really want to. So we will develop um, workflows and work with the IHO crowdsource bathymetry working group um, to basically become a trusted node um, either through the global center or through the Southwest Pacific center. You know, basically, we all take the burden of processing the data um, from the community if they really wish it um, and make sure that it goes into um, the, the, the uh, IHO CSB workflow and into the IHO DCDB. Uh, one of the things that um, has been recognised, we've always mentioned in the past about multi resolutions. Um, we've given those slides talking about the different depth band, um, uh, giving different resolutions depending on depth bands. Um, with the understanding that, that those slides are for how we calculate um, the statistic of the 100%, but also with the understanding that um, the 400, the, the 15 arc second product that we currently do is not suitable, is not fit for purpose for uh, those coastal areas where a higher resolution product may be better. So one thing that we are exploring um, and we're hoping to get some prototypes out in the next 12 months is um, some regional high resolution grid products um, based on those depth bands. Uh, that's something that um, we uh, were working together, certainly in the in the in the um, non-polar regions, the non-polar polar data centres. Uh, we hope to get a product out uh, for testing to the community by this time next year. And, and the last thing I want to flag is, um, you know, we've had three three regional meetings now that have been virtual. Um, I, I really, really want to have this meeting next year 
um, as a as a hybrid in person and virtual uh, meeting. So I'm just flagging out there that next year we intend to have uh, an in person meeting somewhere in the Pacific. Um, if all else fails, we'll have it in Wellington. But I'm really hoping that if someone out there um, is really interested in, in hosting the next annual meeting, uh, if, you, if you can let us know, it'd be really good to actually have um, the meeting um, just around the region somewhere else. Um, but just flagging it for everybody's uh, notice that next year's meeting uh, will be roughly the same time, sometime between May and July 2023, uh, and we intend it to be an in-person meeting um, with, a, with a hybrid, with a virtual option uh, for those who, who can't make the travel. Um, and lastly, uh, how we can help, um, just if anyone has any questions, just contact us, uh, Pacific at cb20theatre.org. Um, we, and if you've got any questions, if there's a, uh, a conversation or a meeting you want to have with a, one of the presenters, just flick us an email and we can get you in touch with one of the presenters. Um, if you want to get in touch with Christy or the team at IHO, you can go through the website or again, just flick us an email and, and contact us. Um, one thing I would put a call out for the audience members is over the years, we have noticed there have been um, artifacts and errors within the Jebco product. Um, we do encourage you in the, uh, uh, listening in that um, if you can download the Jebco 2022 grid around your part of the world, and um, if you do see any artifacts or any errors or any obvious um, omissions, just contact us and, and so that we can get those those issues fixed and addressed for next year's release. Uh, uh, and I think that's it. Thank you very much. So um, if I could stop sharing. If there are any questions, oh yeah, hi has actually put the list of the recordings. Yes, good point. Recordings, all our recordings for the next three days um, are available there. Uh, they'll be available on our YouTube channel. Um, hi has put the links there. And if you're not sure, um, we will also put links to those onto the centre website on the cb2030.org uh, website. Um, if you go drill down to the South and West Pacific data centre page, we will have links to the last three day sessions on there as well. Uh, are there any questions? Responses? If not, um, I think we'll finish off if we can before everyone signs off with a photo opportunity. Um, last chance photo opportunity if we could get everybody today to um, put your cameras on uh, or get uh, a page a page you get some photos taken so hi if you can um, just talk us through make sure that we let us know when all the all the photos are taken Right, um, thank you everybody. Just before everyone goes, I'd just like to say a thank you very much to Haya. Haya is leaving the centre in a couple of weeks time. She's going to go into better things looking after a, a fleet of vessels around the world through Inkfish. Uh, and we're going to miss you Haya and thank you very much uh, for your service. And thank you everybody much for listening. Thank you. Yeah.